It's a celebration of passionate people and the ideas that motivate them. I'm Helen Cheresky, this is Robin Ince, and in this episode we have two guests as always and we're going to invite them to tell us about the two people each, so that's four in total, who have shaped their work. I love, that's what I love about science communication. <laughs> you felt the same, two people each, somebody going, she's a scientist, how many is that really? We can't work it out at home. It's four. Good, good, good. Thank you. Now move on. Well, ambiguities, ambiguity causes problems in life. We can't be having problems. Uh, anyway, it's about celebrating the connections between us all. We are recording this here at the Royal Institution in London, and we have a very enthusiastic audience joining us here in the conversation room. Give us a whoop, audience. <laughs> Gosh, that was a lot of a whoop. You lot are, worried. You lot are awake today. Um, okay, so, uh, well, Robin, what have you been thinking about this week? Well, no, I want to know about you because you are very tired. Yeah, I can I'm tell because tired. you read that at incredible speed as if to go, I don't know when I'm going to start falling asleep, so One I better get through Robin, this. One day, Robin, I'm going to be able to speak at the same number of words per minute as you. Oh, I think you're not far off. I think you, me and Ben Goldacre, that's uh, quite a cacophony. <laughs> but, um, but you've spent this week with talking to robots, haven't you, oh, which is why robots. you're exhausted. Yeah, well, so I've been helping out a friend by hosting panel discussions at this the Global Robotics Conference, which is going on in London right now somewhere in the Excel. And uh, some of the robots are very nice and they're just little graspy things that move things around. Ocado are all over their robots, it turns out. Again, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? That generally, say, if you were talking about a human being rather than a robot, saying they're really nice, they're just graspy, <laughs> is kind of very 1970s, Yeah, but on it? the scale of the robots available, so the nice ones are the ones that just pick things up and put things... And then there's the other ones. They kill you. Yeah. <laughs> they seem surprised that I kept asking them, like, are you sure the world wants your robots? They're like, oh, yes, the world definitely wants our robots. And I would show pictures of these robots, you know, on social media. People were like, oh, I don't think we want those robots. Um, but, you know, there was this guy, there is, uh, the guy, one of the guys I interviewed on stage is known as the guy, the man who made a copy of himself. And he has a robot that has incredibly realistic skin and fingers and arms, and it, it mimics his gestures. So he stood behind it, and the robot gave his talk. And I was supposed, you know, you're supposed to be thinking of clever questions to ask or something. I was just sitting there going, I can't believe what I'm watching. Um, so did you have that uncanny valley thing? What, what was your brain doing that? You know, the uncanny valley, which is where we see something that looks very, very similar to a uh, human being, just to that point where people go, ooh, I don't like that. It, it wasn't... Something what it was was just astonishment that it was. It was clearly not human, even though it looked it, it looked like him and not like him. It clearly wasn't human, but it was just astonishment at the way at the detail in the facial muscles. It was like a, the te a technical achievement, and it talked and it kind of interrupted occasionally, uh, but it did it. It it did it. It was obviously a robot, but it did it in a very like the the, the movement was so natural. It was astonishing to watch. Anyway, so he thinks we all want one of these. I don't think we do. Because um, so there is yeah. that, wasn't there? There was Philip K. Dick. They made a version of his head, didn't they? Which which was like that. And then it went missing and no one knows. It got lost oh, in Oh, we're about to, is it about, we're in the Royal Institution. That's the kind of thing they've got, like in the basement. Oh, no, no, no. This is <laughs> post-1873. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, it's, it's a, 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 I can't remember what the, the book's called. You haven't read it, have you, Tom? It is called something like Who Stole Philip K. Dick's Head? And it's just the idea that one day someone will be rummaging around in, in their attic in like in a kind of more benevolent version of the film Seven. They'll open a box and go, Whoa, it's Philip K. Dick's Head! You know, which I think will, will be quite exciting. Well, it depends whether it's talking to them or not. We should uh, introduce our guests, actually, since we've already begun to include them in the conversation. Um, so our first guest this week is Professor Sue Black, who is a forensic anthropologist. And, of course, many of you will know her as last year's Christmas lecturer here at the Royal Institution. She gave her lectures on secrets of forensic science, and uh, she's had a very distinguished academic career, and as well as doing all sorts of things like investigating war crimes and suspicious deaths, and she's now the um, president of St. John's College, Oxford. And our second guest is Professor Tom Shakespeare, who is a professor of disability research in the medical faculty at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and a well-known campaigner for disability rights and a writer on disability, genetics, and bioethics. But there's an, an interesting link between, because Tom and me, and you probably met 
for the first time only a few years ago. Yep. And uh, and our dads went to school together, didn't they? Which is uh, kind of it's intriguing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And my mum worked uh, with um, uh, uh, a famous comedian's uh, mother. Uh, so very, it's all very spooky. Yeah. Um, and I, I, Sue, as well, we, when you did that uh, Christmas lecture, which I thought was a fantastic uh, Christmas lecture, what was that? Because if you didn't see it, go and watch it now. Go and it, because it was this wonderful thing, basically creating a kind of trial scenario based on the evidence around. And it was, it was, it was quite complex, wasn't it? What was the hardest sell in terms of? Because obviously, some of the information you've got, and this is predominantly for children as well. Uh, even though I think adult, all adults should watch them. Uh, but some of it obviously has a kind of a, a level of the grotesque and the gory. What, what surprised you that you managed to sneak in? I, I think for us it was we wanted to be able... You can't do a Royal Institution lecture without animals. So whether they're llamas or goats or dogs or cats, where they have to be animals, there's always one. And we thought, well, how do we get an animal? And we got a, we got a cadaver dog in and because we, we're going to be looking for a body. But the trouble is our cadaver dogs are all trained on human blood. And the Royal Institution, oh, you can't have human blood. And I think, well, we can't get the dogs trained and get them to find what we're looking for if we don't put human blood there. So we managed to fool the dogs. That's all I'm saying. I'm not giving any secrets away. <laughs> but we did manage to fool them. Yeah, that sounds worse than whatever it was you might have said otherwise. I'm not going there. I'm just not going there because I couldn't possibly give up that secret. You know, to my shame, once these kind of things. Uh, so I was filming once um, with sharks that, you know, and we were supposed to be proving that they, didn't, they don't go for human blood because sharks are not stupid. And, um, and I was like, oh, well, I'll just, you know, drip some blood in there. And like, oh, no, 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 you're the presenter. You can't give any blood. And I was like, no, no, like, I'm not letting some poor researcher donate blood to this cause and not me. And I was really insistent about it. And then they sneaked me away on the, on the health and safety thing. And the, the researcher donated drips of blood to this shark. And I am like, I was so appalled. So I have not been able, I would have donated blood for the dogs to thing to make up for my like I, I may deficiencies. have I may have oh, I'm regretting the same, that now. <laughs> same thought train <laughs> what I would have done is snuck in a chemistry lecture because if you get someone like Andrea Seller they are naturally clumsy and more often than not everywhere. may well blow a finger yeah. off and and then just use whatever was left of them but what we had was a wonderful moment when oh we were just a, a week away from filming one of the lectures and and of course unfortunately everything went to the lawyers because it has to go to the lawyers to make sure that everything gets passed. They went, you can't have a murder. It's forensic science. What do you mean you can't have a murder? <laughs> and then they said, well, you can't call it a knife. <laughs> what do you want me to put? You can call it a dagger. You can't call it a knife. Because there's knife crime, there isn't dagger crime. See, I see, and, and obviously you are originally, you know, you used to be at Dundee University, but there's nothing more Crocodile Dundee now than seeing you go, call that a dagger? <laughs> this is a dagger. Um, yeah. And Tom, the first, well, one of the first long conversations we had was about a rather a wonderful book called uh, The Journal of a Disappointed Man. By Barbellion, or uh, that was his uh, pseudonym, yeah. And it's all about disability, and he writes as a person who is confined, he's bed-bound, we might say, and yet, and now there's a prize, the Barbellion Prize, for the best book of, um, written by a disabled person. So it's been going a few years, it's a very good thing. But we were both very enthusiastic about that book. It's the most wonder, uh, again, please find, I, I mean, I, I bought it because I do judge a book by cover, and it was, it was the old Penguin, I think the purple, uh, the, uh, I can't remember exactly, which is memoir, I think, memoir colour when they have the, the different systems, and, and I just thought that title, The Journal of a Disappointed Man, then it starts with that line, which is, you know, I, I was going to, what was it, I, I, I was going to write an essay on what cats do in their free time, but I've now, to, and he was 13 years old when he started this diary, and so also the fact that as he was becoming more ill, and it was undiagnosed, and, and his desires to escape from being a journalist, journalist, to his love of nature and scientific ideas. It's one of, when he writes about love, when he writes about falling in love and the fears of expressing that love, I mean, it's, it's one of the most beautifully honest books I've ever read. He's an Edwardian repressed uh, guy and it's difficult and he's disabled. He has a chronic illness, so that's very difficult. Yeah, so, yeah, and look up the Barbellion Prize as well. So that's fantastic. Well, we should maybe get started on hearing our influences. Um, so you've got one each. We know about one of them. We don't know about the other one. Um, so, Sue, perhaps you'd like to go first. Who is your person you'd like to tell us about? Uh, not surprising, I suppose, because I am an anatomist, first of all, and a forensic anthropologist, second. It's Andreas Vesalius. And Vesalius, 1514 to about 1564, I think it was, um, when he died... So he changed the world. 
and he, he is one of those genuine individuals who changed the world. Anything in terms of anatomical form before him, pre-Vesalian, is how it's limited, because it was based on Galen, and most of Galen's philosophies were based on animal models. So all the charts that were produced, all of the, 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 the writings, just didn't apply to the human at all. And so Vesalius became so involved in his subject that he thought, if I'm going to understand the human body, I need to dissect the human body. And that was considered something quite abhorrent because at the time it was believed that man was created in God's image and therefore to defile the body, to desecrate the body was actually, it, it, was, it was a real sort of no-no, it was a bit of a sin. And so he really walked a very fine line at that time of what was permitted and what was not. But he was smart enough that he, he got himself well involved with the royalty in Europe at the time, so he was well protected in many ways, and he started to dissect the human body. And alongside an artist, Kalkar, what he did was he started to produce the drawings. And the drawings were so intricate and so usable today that he just blew most of Galen's theories out of the water. So Galen believed that the, the jaw was in two parts. Of course, it is in the child. But in the adult, what Vesalius was able to show is it was one, one bone. And that's just a simple example. So from that moment in time, everything before his book that was published, and of course, it's wonderful when, when sort of technology coincides, because we have printing presses at that point, so we can produce mass numbers of books. It's not just the single, you know, hand copied. So we have a marvelous combination of somebody with a vision, somebody alongside an incredible artist who in fact was trained by Titian, and we also have the printing press all coming together that he produces a bestseller. And because you can now get many of these copies, his ideas of anatomy spread around the world. And anatomy is the subject on which all medicine is based. It was the first science before any other applied areas uh, arose. So from that point onwards, all of our medical developments, all of our understanding of human form came from Andreas Vesalius. And when it was published, do you know whether he got pushback because he obviously had been dissecting dead bodies, or did people recognize the value of it immediately? Do you know anything about the response he got? He had both. So, so the Emperor Charles V was very much his supporter, and he understood that, that this was a breakthrough. So to have somebody like the Holy Roman Emperor on your side, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a good big brother to have. So he was semi-protected. But where, where he really faced backlash was in his colleagues, because they were a bit jealous of the fact that he was starting to get celebrity treatment because he was somebody who was doing something different and was clearly having a huge amount of support. So the backlash came from his colleagues who wanted to stay very much with Galen's approach to anatomy, and he battled them. And when, when, when Vesalius died, he died in debt, so he was never you know, made a huge amount of money out of it. He didn't want to. He could have gone on the circuit, like you know, any, any academic, he could have gone on the circuit. He didn't, he went out, and through his medical degree, he administered to lepers. So he was very much focused on what he wanted to do. And if he wanted to train people to become good doctors, he felt he had to produce a textbook for them. So I like to think that he, he held very dear to his principles and, and was a, a good sort, even though he was dissecting dead people. Can I just say, by the way, one of the things that I'm enjoying most is the way that you're wearing your glasses on your thumb, which <laughs> means you look like a low-budget 1970s children's TV show. <laughs> Or, or, or a finger bob up. that's getting on a bit and now needs glasses. <laughs> but I, I, I was, um, sorry, I, I get distracted by my most, because I've just been watching that moving around and one <laughs> suddenly go, but here's someone else with an opinion. <laughs> anyway, so, um, but I, I, in terms of what, because I remember reading about Galen saying that uh, he, uh, he was, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, excellent. This is, I'm expecting similar work from you. If you need a spare don't, sock, don't worry, yeah, yeah. I've got one. Um, but I, I am, <laughs> I, I remember reading that Galen, one of the first times they started thinking the brain might be the place where this was actually thought and, and had controlled some of our action, was seeing gladiator wounds. Mm. So that when people had got wounds in, in their head or to their skull, they'd go, hang on, they're beginning to behave in an erratic way. But, I mean, it seems such a, a slow Very. 
process. And that is all because, because I think, was it Aristotle who, he, he always told, he had this whole thing about how many teeth uh, a woman had. Yes. And it was wrong. And, and that's one of the easiest experiments to do. I mean, that really is. That's open well, wide he, and I'll count. He, he believed men had more teeth than women because men have bigger mouths than women. But he could have just said, oh, I mean, that, so, so apart from those things like with Galen and stuff where there would be accidents and it was almost impossible, the rest of the time was a lot of people just going, well, we don't need to observe, we just need to think very hard. And, so, so, and based on animals. Hmm. So, so they would dissect animals and assume that it, it was going to be the same in the human. So they believed that because there were four chambers in the heart and there were four humours, each chamber was for a particular humour. You know, so, so you just create the story around it. But it persisted for 1,400 years. A long time people were just disciples of Galen and disciples of, of that very slow process of development, which really wasn't development. In many ways, it was regression. And then you get this, this Wunderkind coming along saying, this is all wrong, and here we're going to show you it's wrong. And he can do that because every time he dissects another cadaver and another cadaver and another, look, they're all looking the same. So what I'm seeing is correct. But he was quite respectful of Galen, so he, he wasn't out to just diss him completely. What he was prepared to say was the reason he didn't get this right was because the dissection was done on a dog or a cat. It wasn't about any point saying that, you know, Galen was a charlatan or anything like that. But Vesalius was not, I mean, he sounds like an Italian Vesalius, but he wasn't, he wasn't was he? no. So he was Flemish. Um, so he was born in what is sort of current day Brussels. And von Vessel was his family name, which means weasel. And if, if you look at his coat of arms, it has three weasels on it. So it, they all Latinized their names because it made them sound more... Better, yeah. Yes, it made them sound more educated. So he's a posh weasel. He's a posh weasel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about, sorry, I was just wanted to ask about... Your experience, because I presume, obviously, you've attended autopsies, yeah. and and I, I just think about the time that I had a brain scan and and being able to look. Did at they my, find anything? No, no, no. It's a, it's, it's a, <laughs> empty. It's, it's empty. a Schrodinger system, by okay. the way. I'm in, I'm in a superposition of basically having no brain and an enormous brain somewhere in between. And but it is. Uh, I know that was that genuinely. I wondered if that would happen. <laughs> if, if as long as I didn't know empty. that I didn't have a brain, fine. <laughs> Somewhere between the Wizard of Oz. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I was just wondering, in, in terms of how much it changes for you and the sensation of yourself. Like when I, I saw my brain, there was just, just that kind of, wow, that's it. That's the object inside me. And you, if you're attending an autopsy, for instance, and then you're thinking about what is inside you and the actions that are going on in your body all the time, how much that changes your sensation of, of what it is to be alive. It's interesting because I do look at people knowing what's underneath the skin. So, so I, I do look deeper in my own mind than what we see superficially. And everyone in the room is suddenly very nervous. But, <laughs> so, so, so if you're in any diet, if you look at the back of your right hand and you find the vein patterns on the back of your right hand, they'll be different to the vein patterns on the back of your left hand. And that's just simple, obvious anatomy. So being able to know that there are differences. Every single one of us has anatomical differences in everything. And when you go, first go into a dissecting room and you put that blade onto a scalpel and you know that you're going to cut through human skin, it's a Rubicon. You can never go back once you've done that. And in anatomy, you either love the subject or you hate the subject. And if you love it, then you, know, you, just, you can lose yourself in that world. It can take you 10 years or more, if you ever, to learn all of the anatomy within the human body. There's just, it's just such an incredible specimen. It really is. So I, I taught at Norwich Medical School, and I went to an anatomy lecture do, doing a sort of uh, uh, a peer review of a lecture, and it was cooler. And people who had done lots of anatomy lectures said, you will be hungry when oh, yes. you come out. So tell me about the Food. hunger. So everything, everything we talk about relates to food. Yeah. So, for example, when we would have um, ambulance crews in, for example, um, and in the dissecting room at that time, you embalmed bodies with formalin. And the ambulance crews, we were teaching them anatomy, we would always refer to, muscle looks like tuna, doesn't it? You know, because it's slightly brown. But we knew, because we'd arranged with a canteen, that when they went back to the canteen, <laughs> it would be tuna salad that night. Vile. And so, you, you know, you can play with people's minds that way. But it's, it's always food. You're always hungry. You are hungry, hungry after a dissection. I'm, I'm vegetarian. Yeah. Would I be hungry? Yes. Yeah. 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 You look at it and you think, ooh, meat. Yeah. Yes, that does not make me hungry. Anyway, yeah. I was just curious. Yeah. <laughs> What about the emotional relationship with it? Because I, I remember talking to a woman who's, who's uh, I think, going to start the first body farm in, in Canada. 
you know, you, uh, I'm sure you all know about body farm, basically where you can leave your body to a body farm and then it's to find out the way that different bodies kind of, uh, well, well, basically rot, basically yeah. decompose. And, and, and she said, my mum and dad have both given their bodies to a uh, body farm. And I wondered how I would feel. And I thought, yes, for the first five or ten minutes, I'd probably be sad. But then I would very much think, well, this is not them. This is their vehicle. And I think I kind of feel like that as well. Uh, and I wondered how, whether there was a change in your feeling of the attachment to the physical self and, and, and the, the mind. That so, so anatomy is a subject, it, it's ingrained in you, the whole importance of dignity, decency, respect. And I, have prob I personally have problems with body farms. Um, bodies are left out to look at how they decompose, how they rot, animal activity. There's a, a part of me doesn't see the decency, the dignity, and the respect in that. When you look at the science that comes out of most body farms, it's very specific to that area. So if you take two bodies and you bury them in the same field, you know, maybe you know, a few meters apart, they will decompose differently because the bodies have a different environment themselves. One may take prescription drugs, the other may not. One may be wearing clothes, the other may not. They will decompose differently. Animal activity, if you're partly under, under vegetation, so bushes or trees, or you're out in the open, you'll decompose differently. Whatever time of year it is that you go in, you'll decompose differently. So it doesn't necessarily bring us to a point of saying we're any more aware of the, the taphonomic processes, how a body breaks down, thanks to body farms. But they make great news stories and great films and great novels and those sorts of things. But I question whether there's, whether there's a validity to it. I certainly wouldn't want to have somebody of mine in that position where the camera is watching animals, you know, consuming the flesh, my mother melting away, whatever it may be. I, I wouldn't so how, want how would you do that science? How would you find those things out? Um, th there is no easy way. So, so there are equivalent facilities that use animal models rather than human, and, and pigs are probably as close to human model as we can get. But the science is so imprecise that I'm not convinced that there is a precision to that because there are so many variables. How do you account for them all? You probably can't. And so there comes a point where science is great, but if it's, if it's not getting to the end point and you're not getting the result, you can flog the dead horse as many times as you like. It still isn't going to get back up and live. And I think we're almost at that stage with taphonomic facilities. There's no easy way to move on from that in terms Sorry. of topics. But I don't know, the flogging of the dead horse. Did that was a I good line. That was yeah, a great I, line. I feel... So, okay, so let's move on. So, Tom, who is the first person you'd like to talk um, about? So, he's a guy called Sebastiano Timpanaro. He was an Italian Marxist in the 1970s. And um, I wish I bought my copy of his book um, on materialism. But it's all about how it's a bit like what you were saying. At the end of the day, we are flesh and blood. And as you, uh, in my area, which is understand disability, um, there's a sort of social constructionist strand which would lose sight of the fact that we are bodies and the bodies and minds don't work very well and they fall apart and they don't do what they're meant to do. And they concentrate too much, I think, on uh, cultural ideas and social relations and all the rest of it. And they forget that you are a body and it's the failure of your body or your brain. And not just my body or brain, friends, all your bodies and brains, even yours, um, especially mine. Especially yours on a Saturday night. That's what makes you, that's what determines you. And so Sebastiano Timpanaro is somebody who says nature determines you in ways you haven't thought. Not just your bodily nature, but external nature. And in a way, he's an environmental activist before, you know, 30 years before that became uh, pr prevalent and popular. Um, so he's a, he's a very interesting thinker. What he says is fairly obvious, but it is a, um, uh, a rejoinder to everybody who thought that to be human is to be clever and to be the lord of all you survey. Uh-uh, you're going to die. 
And do you, do you remember... Cheerful tonight. Do you remember, Spoiler alert, by the yeah. way. Do you remember, well, do you remember where you first came across, you know, where you first read the yeah, book? Yeah, right? yeah. Um, it was in the New Left Review. It's a guy called Perry Anderson who translated, I think, the work from Italian into English. Um, and in fact, um, Tim Bernaro, you might not have heard of him, was more popular in Britain because of that than he was in Italy. Because he was a trot as well. We forgive him that. Um, and he was also a philologist. Philologist is the science of language. And um, that's not what he talked about. So in a way, the, 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 the political people thought, what are you doing? It's the Italian Communist Party is where it's at. And the philologist said, what are you doing? This, you're going way beyond your specialism. But I like that. Um, go beyond your specialism. And I like the fact that he said it as it was, as he saw it. And he said, you know, so for example, it's memorable image. And if you know about Marxism, you know that uh, everything is determined by the economic substructure. And he said it's a bit like the occupant of a first floor flat saying to the top floor, you know, you all depend on me, all you cultural stuff, you're based in economics, that's me. And the people at the ground floor are saying, you depend on us. You depend on the natural world. You depend on your physical nature. You can't take that for granted. And so I think it sounds obvious, but it was worth saying, and it's always influenced me. Is that when you were talking there about going out of kind of his, his comfort zone or his area of specialism, uh, is that something that you feel in academia might be an issue, which is that some people remain very specifically in their departments, and the department is not... And as we know, with every single... I know it's, it's something that I think is wrong with an education system, which are there are these subjects. There you go. There's the line of that subject, and there's the line of that subject. But, of course, all of those different ways of crisscrossing. Do we need to see more of that? I think we do. Um, we, uh, me and a colleague called Duncan Dallas, uh, launched this thing called Café Scientifique, Science Café. Um, and so I've uh, hosted, like you are hosting, many uh, fellows of our society and, and, and all the rest of it. And it's amazing how they go, oh, I can't tell you about that. You know, I don't know anything about that. What I know about is worms. I can tell you everything about worms, but I can't tell and you. And I'm sitting there going, you know a lot more about that than I do. You're a scientist. You did biology. You could actually you know, talk about all of this, but they go, nope, that's my subject, I'm sticking to it. And I think that's, that's how people are trained in the sciences. And I think that as long as you say, this is what I've done research on, this is what I've been taught but I haven't tested, as long as we're clear, and this is astrology and bollocks, as long as it's clear um, the basis on which you're making a pronouncement, like, you know, I trust you on anatomy. I'm not sure I trust you on audiology. You might be great, but... Or with the horse she's got. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly not. Um, but you have a research background. You have a teaching background. You know about what you talk about. And as long as you're clear about that, I think you should talk about whatever you want to. And the world we now have is inferior because people don't talk about other things. And I think you talked about Darwin at the start. I think his um, uh, uh, origin of species by means of natural selection. One of the things about that is it was the last science book that lay people could understand. Because anybody could pick up that book. I, I, I managed to get my 10-year-old goddaughter to buy a copy of the book in the Natural History Museum. Um, anybody can understand it. But now, if you take a book of physiology or anatomy or whatever, you're not going to understand it. It's going to be really difficult. Um, and I think that's a problem because we've lost... Uh, it may be coming back through things like this, through things like um, all of your work uh, and your work and your work. <laughs> and you. And you're, and you're here. You're clearly interested. And so I think we need to have more interdisciplinarity, more people saying, well... I've researched this, that's what I really know about, but I've been trained in this and therefore I can talk. You don't have to believe me, but you know, go off and find out for yourself. But I know more than I'm letting on. That's interesting. There's a, there's a book that I've been banging on about a lot 
called Undrowned. Uh, um, black, f- what's it? Uh, I've, got, I've got this actually mentioned in uh, this my book, which is available. Uh, You're going to look at the index uh, of your own yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I just, That's why you write books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got more It is. Because it's why, why I keep... No, yeah, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals by Alexis Pauline Gums. And it's such an interesting book because when I... I was given it by someone called Murray from the wonderful Lighthouse Bookshop in, in Edinburgh. And it's about... Here was this poet who became fascinated in sea mammals and then she's putting up lots of pictures on Instagram of these sea mammals and then she started to read more about the sea mammals and she realised that some of the ways that the sea mammals' behaviour had been interpreted, their physicality had been interpreted and all of those other things were much as we would love to say, oh, it must have been done in the most objective manner. It also betrayed who was dominant in the society at the time. Mm. And I think, you know, to, to have that there, that doesn't weaken science, it doesn't weaken philosophy to be honest and say we are influenced by who yeah. is the most powerful in our culture. It's a very, very be- beautiful book as well. I mean, it's science is the human endeavour. I mean, the natural world is beyond us, but we look at what we see. Um, I was very influenced by uh, Mary Mitchley, and she talks about um, there's one aquarium but many windows. So the interdisciplinarity is you looking through a particular porthole, I'm looking through another porthole, and they're equally, hopefully, good, but we need them all in order to understand what's in the middle. Mm. It makes me, it's interesting listening to you talk about this because I absolutely agree with you on the pluralistic you know, ways of looking at things, but I also know that, you know, so I write science cons, I, the emails I get are from retired professors in other subjects yeah. who assume that the, because they're a professor of things X, they therefore know all of everything about everything. And so this is interesting. I agree with you. It's like the people who are perhaps too shy to offer an opinion probably could do it a bit more, and the people who are not shy at all, they could do it a little bit less. But it's yeah. interesting like, how, you, how you describe that balance, right? It requires some self-discipline. So, so we have to be able to convey our science to the public in the courtroom. And the most impo- important people in the courtroom are the jury, and the jury are members of the public. And the jury, as the public, watch CSI and Silent Witness and all of these truly interesting (laughs) (laughs) we were all waiting we were all everyone had Um, held their breath at that point they think they're forensically (laughs) aware so that we have a really difficult job we are always a disappointment when the real forensic science comes into the courtroom they see everything having been done with great flashing lights and whiz bang and remote everything and your holograms or whatever and we're saying, well, we can't get a DNA sample back. We've been trying for six months. They go, but you can get a DNA back in 40 minutes in CSI. <laughs> so the, there's a real, an, an educated public in some ways, from our perspective, can be a real problem because there's an expectation of us that we just can't deliver. Isn't I, it? Sorry, Tom. No, I, I, absolutely, as you say. I'm reading a book called Quantum Bullshit, um, which is all about how quantum physics is used totally spuriously to give sort of, you know, this is quantum shampoo or quantum breakfast cereal or whatever it might be, because quantum sounds good. We want more of that, please. And it's all about how ideas pass into popular culture and lose what made them distinctive. So, but we'll move on from Deepak Chopra, uh, because he does that all the time. I I imagine he appears in this book that you're reading quite a lot. But I'm interested that bit where... Because what you're saying, Helen, I think, is people telling you that you're wrong, aren't you? Well, actually, yeah. whereas the bit that is far more interesting is, like when you were mentioning Darwin, I always find what's so beautiful about his writing is he goes, I was wondering if it might be the case, therefore, that, and perhaps it's, and so it's a perhaps and a maybe. It's humility. And that's that beautiful thing, I think, with a lot of the discussions that we've had, which is, as you said, people aren't scared to get involved, but they're not getting involved saying, I know about this. Yep. Going, I was just wondering, do you think it could be that? Okay, but it's probably not that. That's the, the I, I, I hesitate to tread in your world, but science is meant to be humble. Science, you know, you come up with theory, and it is a theory, until it is disproved. You don't know. There might be other places in the universe or other places in the world where it's very different, and so it's always provisional. So for us, it's about identity, and we're always looking to say, you know, is, is this the person who we think it is? And there is no way to be 100% certain on the identity of a deceased. So if, you know, a body is found where you don't expect it to be, it's on a hillside or whatever, um, you can take the DNA samples, but DNA is still based on a probability. Now, it might be a very low probability, but it's one in a billion, but it's still a probability. So you can never be 100% certain on identity, but you can be 100% certain that it's not that person. 
And that's quite difficult to get across to people, that we have certainty in one part and the certainty is in the negativity, mm. but we don't have certainty in the positivity. So you can disprove something, but you can't prove it. Yes. I think that's, that's a guide to life. <laughs> Can I ask you uh, just about because why we've got here that thing that I was watching the film Gorky Park and Ian McDermott. Oh, I haven't seen that, that in years. It's got a great soundtrack yeah. as well and uh, Alexi Sell and Lee Marvin and uh, they're only filmed together I think tragically and uh, um, Ian McDermott plays one of the before he went to the dark side plays one of those people who uh, gets a skull and then they end up getting a face that looks exactly the same as the person who is actually the, the missing person. That technology of being able to take a skull or, you know, or rotting bones and then build, how, how true is that? Because I find that, that just amazing. So um, if, you, if you speak to the experts in that area, what they will say is we are trying to build a likeness that is sufficient to jog somebody's memory. So that looks a bit like, and then you've got a name that you can go and check. So you're not trying to produce a, a, a fantastic replica, because you look different if you put on a few stone or if you take off a few stone, if you grow a beard or, or not. I'm, you know, give me long enough, I'll challenge you on a beard. Um, you know, so, so the faces will change, um, and we're not trying to get a perfect representation just enough to jog a memory. But I have seen reconstructions done that we have subsequently then gone on to prove who the individual is, that you've thought, my goodness me, there's no doubt. You know, so sometimes it's really good. Now, if we get it right, of course, then it's likely because they were close. If you've got a facial reconstruction expert who's not very good, chances are they're gonna produce a face that wouldn't look anything like the individual. So you don't get the identification. So you don't know whether you got it right or not, because it remains a cold case. The only ones you do know is when you get the mm. actual hit. So it's stacked in that way. But some of the reconstructions are phenomenal in terms of, of how, how useful they are in the process. But if you're looking back at sort of prehistory, and obviously they're very keen to reconstruct the pharaoh or the, the, the bog burial or whatever it is, how much should we take that as a well, that's an artist's impression? It depends who does it. So, uh, you know, if you've got the, the real experts, they'll produce as close to a replica of the face as it could be. But what you can afford to do with the archaeological is play around with it a bit more. Mm. So you can change skin tone, you can place hair on, you can, you know, um, put jewellery on, whatever you like. In a forensic one, you don't. Mm. Often the, the face is reconstructed in black and white because you don't want to influence people what the skin tone may be like. You use a generic hairstyle because you may not have hair remaining if all you've had is a skull. So you, you go very broad and very genetic, uh, generic on the um, forensic ones. Mm. But on the ar archaeological, you can have you, a bit more fun. You let your imagination rip, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. a bit more fun. Uh, we should probably get on to your second people, because we, the, the, the second podcast... People. The second people? The second people. We have one yeah, each. No, I know what you mean, yeah. Listen, it's, it's been a hard one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. um, so, Sue, your second your uh, guest. I, ju I just happened to notice it was here. And so it's Billy Connolly. Oh. Uh, so... Um, Billy Connolly, as, as you might tell, I'm a Scot. Um, and as a teenager, he was one of the first performers that I went to see. And of course, it was terribly rude. I was in Inverness, which is in, you know, in, the, in the highlands of Scotland. So the things that he was saying was shocking, which as a teenager was just wonderful. But I can remember it was the first time that I, I was aware of my sides hurting with laughter and tears rolling down my face. And, you know, we don't have that kind of belly laughs very often. Not really, the ones that just get, you know, uncontrollable. But he had identified a sort of observational humour that hadn't been done before. And the way that he conveyed it in a language, certainly in Scotland, that we understood, just made it feel natural. And what I liked about him, as well as that observational humour, because, I, you know, we spend a lot of time watching people because that's what the forensic science is doing. It's watching people and, and being able to see behaviors and patterns. But what he also did for me was, he, he got into, he's got into, in his life, huge amounts of trouble on all sorts of things. And in one particular point in Scotland, he really got himself in trouble with the church. And um, they were out, you know, campaigning against him. You know, they had pickets outside his, um, his theater uh, because he was saying such dreadful things. And I can remember him being asked, you know, how, why do you do this? And he said, well, you know, if there's a God, and he doesn't necessarily believe there is a God, is if he's a God, 
He's bigger than all this. He's not going to worry about one wee guy from the shipyards poking fun at you. So what are they worried about? Why do they find me such a threat? And for me, that underlying humor, I started to realize there was a real power in humor, which you know better than anybody else. There is a real charisma and a real power in humor. And in my job, you need to have humor because some of the work that we do is truly horrendous. And we need to have that black humor that gets you through a situation. We never make fun of the dead. We never make friend, fun of the family or of the situation. But we do play the most ridiculous, ridiculous practical jokes on each other. And some of the funniest places I've been in the world are mortuaries because you need to have that humor to get through it. And he would get that. So I just love the fact that his humor was, it appeared to be very almost superficial, but it wasn't. It was incredibly broad and incredibly deep, and, and he knew how to use it. And that, for me, was showing how you can wield that power of comedy. Also, his, his curiosity, that's the yeah. thing. One of the, I mean, one of the th many things that marks him out as being, I genuinely don't think there is another comedian who is anything like Billy Connolly. There's not, you know, with most comics, we can all go, that person's a bit like that, that person's a bit like that. You're, but with him, and, and, and that darkness, I, I remember uh, the, the most recent stand-up show that he did, which sadly will, probably will be his, yeah. his, his last one, but he... It was a fascinating thing to watch his stillness because, of course, you know, we were always used to him flying around. And then he was very, very still. And one of the first things he said as he walked on, he got to the microphone, he said, now, I'm going to first of all tell you what's wrong with me because I don't want you symptom spotting throughout the show. <laughs> and that acknowledgement and that joke about... And, and then what was so amazing was then every time he did act something out, the focus... Yeah. It was so intense, you know, and, and it is, I, I, I think you're right as well, that darkness, I mean, since things that have been revealed since, since, you know, his wife Pamela Stevenson wrote the book about him and all those kind of things and the abuse that he experienced when, when he was a child as well. And I think when someone like Billy Connolly talks about that, it's tremendously empowering for a lot of people because yeah. he really is a hero yeah. to so many people. And, they, and that compassion... It's like, you know, the shipyards. I don't know, have you ever seen the documentary he did about Stanley Spencer? Great, mm. He's a great fan of the artist Stanley Spencer. Yeah. And, of course, Stanley Spencer did these enormous paintings of the shipyards, which give you kind of synesthesia, because they're just so... Um, and his fascination, that's the thing, isn't it? I think it, more than comedy, the thing I get from Billy Connolly is you must never stop being curious. Yes about why is that doing that, and who's that over there, and what's that noise, you know? And there is a humility in him as well, because I remember him being asked, what makes you different from any other comedian? He said, I have a banjo. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and I just thought, yeah, you know, that, that, yeah, that's a great line, and it's there, and, and it is the humility. And did you feel it gave you permission? I mean, there's that thing, isn't there, when you see, you, like, you sort of, maybe you sort of want to do something, but when you've seen someone else just do so much more of it, you, did you feel that... It, because he was speaking in the local, you know, your, not your local dialect, I assume you're not from uh, the Glasgow shipyards, I don't know. Probably going to get myself into trouble here. But, um, you know... I might have visited the Glasgow shipyards once or twice, <laughs> but never... <laughs> but did you feel that, but, you know, that... Did you feel enabled by it? Well, y y you were watching somebody that you could relate to, you know, so somebody in a native tongue um, who w was just breaking, breaking, bar you know, barriers and breaking down all these boundaries... And knowing that that could happen, I think there was an element of, of a role model, I think, in many ways. Now, I, I, I have no comedic ability in me whatsoever. If I was, I wouldn't be an academic, would I? Um, you do. That's such a <laughs> lie. I mean, because one of the things that I love is every time that we've done events together is you can see the playfulness. And you can see you're the fact kind. that when you're... So you do... do you know, that, that, that's, I, I want to refute that immediately. Thank you, Matt. You're, you're are, you are very kind. Um, I find humour in life, and I, and I find humour in myself. So I like to laugh at myself, because, but I think it's the way, as he does, you hide behind it. So I, I learnt that he created humour as a shield, and I needed to create a shield as well, because it's part of the protectionism for the dreadful job that we do. And I think he gave me that shield of humour more than anything. If you can self-deprecate, you can hide behind anything. Yeah, I think that there's, there's well, something that I've never talked about before, because, uh, uh, that, but when, uh, when my mum died, and she'd lost some of her teeth in an accident, mm. so she had a, a kind of plate and stuff, and there was something, so there we were, we just lost our mum, but the, the, the co comedy yeah. of trying to put that plate back mm -hmm. in, 
like in the same way the bum note of an organ or something like that, yeah. that, there, that to notice that there is, you know, absurdity, preposterousness, and levels of slapstick yeah. at the same time, and that all and of okay. those things exist in the same, yeah. can exist in the same moment, that, w that one does not belittle the other, that it's like no. kind of, you're experiencing you're the right. worst things, but at the same time. You're right. I mean, when my mother was dying, um, I went with my two girls and my girls in the, to visit her in the hospital. And they were, they were just very young. They were 10 and 12 at the time. And we thought, what do we do? Do we sit at the bedside and cry and moan? We went, no. We, we became the Von Trapp family. So we sang. And we sang every song that we could think of, from Disney through to Christmas songs, through to everything, even you can shove your granny off a bus, which was probably not appropriate. Um, and the nurse would come in, and we'd just fall about laughing. And I thought, you know, if, if it's true that the last sense that goes before you die is hearing, then what my mother will have heard is us laughing. And, you know, it's, it's a love, it's a joy, it's a laughing. She won't have heard us crying. And, and I think that's the last gift that we could give to her. Mm. And I wrote it in, in, a, in a piece that I, I, I did. And a young man came up to me at a, a book festival and he said, thank you just for that, if nothing else. I laughed when my mother was dying and I felt guilty about it ever since. I don't now. Mm. And I think, you know, if that's the sort of thing that you can do, there's a purpose. Amazing. Okay, Tom, let's hear your second... I want to talk yes. about Billy Connolly. Oh, but, yeah. um, <laughs> uh, so my second guess is, um, I'm trying to remember when she laughed, Frida Kahlo. Um, so um, I'm interested in Frida Kahlo for many, many reasons. Um, but she was uh, born with a disability. She probably had her uh, spina bifida. Um, then she developed polio. So you can see many uh, portraits, sub-portraits, where she's wearing a long dress. That's because her legs were disfigured by polio. And then one had a caliper and built up shoe. Um, and then, of course, she had that terrible, terrible accident with a bus where part of the bus went through her skewered her, and all her life she had uh, terrible, terrible pain. She lived about she, uh, 50 years. She, she died, I think, in, in 1953, possibly of an uh, opiate overdose, um, because she was in so much pain throughout her life. And yet, she did these most joyful, wonderful portraits. Mm -hmm. uh, so her portraits, I think, are about a third of what she did. She did all sorts of pictures. But she wasn't popular in her day, there weren't exhibitions of her in Mexico, but she was loved and reclaimed and is now ubiquitous in the right way. Um, uh, and I love that. Um, and nobody more, knew more about disability uh, than I think Frida Kahlo. Some of those paintings uh, of, of which do kind of deal with, you know, the course of the course, yeah, yeah. I mean, they are a, a remarkable mix of both realism and surrealism. Yeah, well, the surrealist said, ah, you're a surrealist. And she said, no, I'm a realist. Yeah. That's what it's like. I'm not making it up. This is what I live. Um, and I, I love that. Also, her mum was uh, Amerindian, was uh, indigenous uh, woman. And so she's got all of that history and a way of looking at the world. Um, I, I think she's great. And, you know, in the modern era, you know, she's truly androgynous, you know. She said that her partner was uh, uh, Diego Rivera, and she said, um, he likes, I like him because he's breasts, and he likes me because of my moustache. So, you know, he is, she is very um, uh, uh, playing with gender, playing with the way that women should be, and or, and... I think that a lot of what we see today, and you might like this or you might not, like Tracy Emin or a lot of artists now, are free to be themselves because of Frida Kahlo. She made it possible. She said, you can make art about your body, about yourself, and it'll be good. That reminds me of... Uh, John Julius Norwich used to do a book called Christmas Crackers, which was a collection of his... Uh, yeah. And I remember the beginning of one of them, and, and because you said we're both going to do Movember as well uh, yeah. later yeah, in the year... Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> has, has, ...has an Italian word... I will which win. Was, I always remember. It was baffona, which meant woman with a not unappealing moustache. Which I think <laughs> is... Uh, but that, that is... I, I, I think that those, those... It's interesting, isn't it, that we see now... You know, also with people like Dorothea Tanning and Leonora Carrington, and I think also a resurgence in Lee Miller. Yeah. That there was a kind of, there was a told story that yeah. became untold and unravelled and is now 
Uh, uh, yeah, there's going to be a ex another exhibition of Lee Miller, quite rightly. Fantastic photograph. Um, and Leonora Carrington, only in the last few decades, has come back to, to the world as a surrealist writer. Um, fantastic, really good. Um, uh, rightly and understandably. But um, some of them brought up children, like Louise Bourgeois. She did nothing until she uh, got rid of the kids and then did her own thing. Um, Others uh, were not discovered, were in the background, um, but there's some fantastic art in the 20th century made by women that is accessible to everybody and is like life changing. And what was the reaction at the time? You know, because you're talking, you said sort of between the, the sort of first part of the 20th century. So what, what, the t what did they think? Well, she didn't have exhibitions in Mexico. But did people uh, recognize her? Was I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Um, so what changed then? How did she become... Well, there's a famous exhibition at the Whitechapel Gallery, uh, I think in the, in the 70s or 80s, which brought her and said, you know, she's not a folk artist. She is an artist, and we should look at her. And I think that was very influential on a lot of young British artists who were coming to fruition at that time. Um, and now she speaks to us. We, we relate to her. She's a powerful woman, um, but she's also a vulnerable woman. And uh, she's not white, you know. So all of the elements of her, she plays with gender. All of the elements of her, we see ourselves in. And we, we I mean, she's not, I don't think, just she's a great painter. But there's a lot of great painters who are not great painters. Um, you know, and, and yet her ideas and the way that she represented, I think uh, the uh, biopic that came out, Frida, um, uh, was very powerful, very influential. Um, and suddenly she is, you know, what everybody wants. And rightly, because she was neglected for decades. It's interesting, that, that bit about not being a great painter, but being a great painter. There was a thing, I think we were talking about last week, I just read an essay by Andy Warhol in his book of philosophy about how he didn't like professional entertainers because he knew they knew what they were going to do. And that's why he was more interested in amateurs. Mm. And then someone also, John Cage, I think it was a John Cage quote, mm. might have been a, a, a Philip Glass quote, but it was about, there's no point in spending too long doing what you know how to do mm. because you won't discover anything. Yeah. And, and I think that's, you know, you mentioned Louise Bourgeois uh, and that the exhibition at the Tate Modern where every room you went into, she went, oh, now she decided to start making sheds. Yeah. Oh, now she decided to start making these, these really fascinating kind of fleshy sculptures. Now she's doing what almost looked like potato prints of human beings. Like when she's about 100 years old, it's like, bored. Right, I know what I'm going to do now. Yeah. Sheds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we, we yeah, all through my um, school days, and uh, yeah, we talk, oh, Picasso, he's the best. Yeah. And he has these different periods and the blue period and all that stuff. Bollocks. <laughs> you know, Louise Bourgeois is way ahead of him. And Frida Kahlo and all these people, often women who were neglected and who now flourish and are celebrated rightly. Who did, uh, so do, do you have someone who, in terms of artists, who you kind of either rediscovered or suddenly gone, oh, I hadn't really... You know that bit where sometimes you're staring at a painting that you might have seen many times before mm. and it suddenly becomes revelatory? Um, so, so there is a there's a, a great chap um, who is an artist in Scotland, Ken Curry, and Ken um, produces some really interesting art. So there's one called the Three Oncologists, and it's looking at these these three surgeons, and it's sort of ethereal. It has a sort of um, sort of ghostly appearance to it, and there's clearly something in front of them which is, um, you know, equipment. I suspect because they're doing surgery but they're looking over their shoulder at you. And it's almost as if they're trying to pull you in to say, look, look what we're doing. And I find every time I look at Ken's work, there's something else in there. He did a lot of the artwork um, portraying disfigurements coming out of the First World War. And they're hard to look at. And he, at one point, was talking about the anatomy. And we were on a radio program together. And I said, well, have you ever been in a dissecting room? And he went, well, no. I said, well, would you want to be? Uh -huh. And, he, you know, I had him on radio, so he couldn't say no. <laughs> and, uh, and so he came to the anatomy department. And once he'd seen what the anatomy was really like, he said, no, I could have been a better artist, because now I, I can see what I, what I thought I was seeing before wasn't necessarily true. Now I would do it perhaps slightly differently. So I loved actually working with him to see his own thought processes going on. But I love the way that he looks at, at medical art and in a different way. 
Right, you know what I'm going to ask you now, don't you? No, I don't. But How I'm... do I get in to see that? Because I really would be absolutely fascinated. Take genuinely... him off. <laughs> yeah. The, uh... C can you get me the keys to the... Uh... He's got you on radio, you can't yeah, say yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, it's been filmed this oh, as well. Uh, watch me, I'm a woman. No. <laughs> it could really improve my drawing. <laughs> Rubbish. I mean, I'm really rubbish. Um, yeah, that 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 uh, the three oncologists is there was, there was a friend of mine during the Edinburgh Fringe mm. Festival who every day he had to go because I think it's it's in that but is, is it it's the, in the National Portrait National Gallery. Portrait. Mm. And and he would go and he would look at that and I'm he would stare at it. So what? Uh, this sounds really pretentious. And I'm really sorry, but on the other side of the wall, he did a portrait of me. And it's called The Unknown Man, because it's about the body that's underneath. And I said they've put it on the wrong wall. If they'd moved it round the corner, you could have had the three oncologists looking over their shoulder at death. And you could have used the space in between the two paintings to really convey almost a third dimension and a depth to it. Oh, you could be a curator of museums. That's great. <laughs> um, we that's something I'd love to see, by the way, Helen. Uh, we, yeah, we yeah, we're right. probably no, but I just want to... That bit of... Uh, I, I remember talking to uh, a scientist who's saying, I wish museums were more of a hodgepodge, that you don't go, this is the science museum, this is the art gallery, that you could go to a museum and you mm -hmm. could look at, you know, the model of the double helix and the kind of... A, and then the next thing you look is at Earthrise, and then the next thing you look at is, you know, kind of a JMW Turner or a Paula Rago, and yeah. all of those things are expressed mm -hmm. together, together because they're all in some ways dealing with mm -hmm. the, the problems and the issues and the questions of humanity. There is a brilliant thing. Oh, sorry, Tom, go on. No, it's some museums are like that. If you go to Cattle's Yard in Cambridge, it's exactly like that. It, but they're small museums where one person has really gathered what they love. Well, the other place you find it actually is in museum stores because they store things according to size. So all the big things are next to each other and all the medium things are next to each other and you get these amazing combinations. And there are not many museums... So um, actually, Royal Museums Greenwich has a collection centre where you can go and you, it's not just where they do the restoration, but it's, it's genuinely where they store the collections and you can go and see and they pull out these drawers and it's got all the shoes that are the same size, but some of them are like the shoes that would came back from the Titanic and some of them are the shoes that were dug out of a, I don't know, a churchyard somewhere. I don't think anyone's dug in shoes out of churchyards. I hope not. Anyway, the, but the point is that it does exist, but it's not, it's not, it's not celebrated enough. I think that everything, you know, display things by size. I think that's a great... I would process. love that going, yes, we're just going to, we don't like the little room very much. <laughs> and we're not really sure about the big room, but the medium room seems just right. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're very happy with that. OK, well, on that point, we are very sadly out of time for this podcast. So um, thank you very much to the audience for listening and laughing along. Thank you to the Royal Institution for hosting us. Um, and thank you, of course, to our two guests, Sue and Tom. We have to do the Patreon plug at the end because Trent scowls if we don't. But but both of us are rubbish at it, so I'm going to try, and then Robin's going to probably correct me. If you would like to donate on Patreon, it's patreon.com slash cosmic shambles. Uh, we try to make things for free to make them as inclusive as possible, but if you can or would like to donate, we would very much appreciate that. And we will be back next week with another episode. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really hope you enjoyed that and we've got loads of other new ideas coming up we've got quite a few things that we've made already and we've got plans to make a lot more things and if you can help it would be great if you could go to patreon.com slash cosmic shambles to help fund all of our big ideas and some of our quite small ideas and if you can't afford to that's absolutely fine as well obviously we want to make these things as free as possible for as many people as possible but if you can subscribe the previous subscribe thing there there or there or there uh, that will be fantastic as well. <laughs>